Evening everyone. Welcome to Leeds Tester Gathering. If we're all ready, then I'll begin. So, welcome to Leeds Tester Gathering. We've, uh, I can't even remember where I started here. <coughs> um, yes, we've got people to talk about. We've got a webinar coming up later and you've got to listen to me for a few minutes. So, once that's out of the way, I'm sure I'll have a really good evening. Um, to start off, thank you to Future Labs. They're our awesome host. We've been here quite a long time. Um, it's a tech hub which helps tech startups. If you want some communal space to work in Leeds and you haven't got an office, um, it's a great place to come to. They, um, they have co-working, hot desking, office spaces. They do events like this and meetups. Uh, and they, they put up with us every sort of six to eight weeks, which is awesome. So uh, very much thank you to Future Labs. If you can support them, do so. Um, some important housekeeping. Uh, make sure your phones are set to silent. Um, there will be breaks between each talks if you are imbibing of the uh, drinks that are at the back. There are no fire drills planned, but if you could please just sit quietly while I get out first and then follow me in an orderly fashion, that would be perfect. And most importantly, if there is an event, please wait till leaving the building before putting it on social media. So, first a word of warning. Leeds Tester Gathering isn't all testers. We do have people from different occupations and different backgrounds. We have developers. These are all really nice people. If you approach them sensitively and don't spook them, they'll, they'll be nice to you and talk back. Um, do we have any first-timers for Leeds Tester Gathering tonight? We have a lot of first-timers, which is awesome. Thank you very much for coming along. Uh, we hold these gatherings very regularly. Uh, they're just normal people come up and share information about what they do or ideas that they've had. And we just try and treat everybody with empathy. Everybody's welcome. And we sort of have a, a standard thing that I've put up there. Be excellent to each other. But I think the last leg said it best. Don't be a dick. <laughs> <laughs> nice, simple rule. Everybody will get along. If you see someone on their own, go talk to them. Make everybody feel welcome. And we'll all have a good time. Now, I was hesitant about the next slide because there's been a lot of contra controversy in the world of technology over the last month or so about a certain Google memo. I don't know if you've all seen this, but basically somebody at Google was trying to use 10th century logic to say why they shouldn't support diversity and inclusion and gender equality um, things at Google. Now, as a straight, fat, middle-aged white guy, I'm probably the least diverse person you'll meet to talk about <laughs> diversity. Interesting fact, the, probably the most diverse thing about me is that I are like punk rock and classical music. So that's about as diverse as you can get, I think. Now, as I'm not qualified to think about this, I'm not going to bat on. But in simple terms, people are people. Everybody's different. And everybody has an opinion that's valuable. Everybody has something that can contribute. You can get two twins. You can have them identical. And they'll be different people. Because obviously one of them is always evil. So just treat everybody like you wish to be treated yourself. And hopefully that will make the world a better place. Who am I? Whitrid up here at you. Um, I'm quite proud that somebody called me the periodic table of testing guy because I invented this thing that I'm trying to share and get feedback on. Um, I blog on thebigtesttheory.com. I actually have a big test theory, but I haven't finished the blog on it. Um, I'm on Twitter at Cricket Rules. If you want to hit me up and chat about testing, I'll talk about testing all day long till the cows come home and when they go away again. So I'm happy to speak to anybody. We have some drink at the back. Please, during the session, drink in moderation. Afterwards, do whatever the hell you want. It's fine. Uh, we have some feed food that will be coming around the half time, mate. Don't be greedy. Let everybody have a chance. And our sponsor for this evening is Fruition IT. These meetings and the free drinks and the pizza and stuff like that wouldn't be possible without our sponsors. Um, the sponsors are for this evening our recruiters and tech skills marketing people, um, they promised they won't try and tap anybody up until we've left the building, which is cool. Um, so form an audio queue outside if you want tapping up. <laughs> um, they're going to have a chat to us to, tonight. Um, it was really interesting. Obviously, I've done my due diligence on the sponsors, so you have to look into these things. So I've gone on and I've had a look at their salary checker. And the next day I asked for a raise. <laughs> so I'm not saying that you should look at their salary checker and ask for a raise. 
but it's a possibility. I've done it. They said they'd think about it. They haven't said no. I'm keeping my fingers crossed. So, they're all good people. A few community events that are coming up. Leeds Testing Atelier. If this is the first time you're hearing about it, you're already too late. It sold out in four days, which is fantastic. But there is a waiting list. You tend to get people dropping out in the, the few days leading up to it. People can't make it. Plans change and stuff. It's basically, they call it a, a punk conference. It's again, it's a bit like this, but on a grander scale. It's a full day of testing talks. There's usually a couple of... Uh, a, a couple of... Tracks, thank you very much. It wasn't a test, I just, my brain's crap. Um, so there's usually a couple of, couple of tracks, people from all over talk about different things. There was about 50% talks from testers and 50% talks from other people. So you get a very wide range of different things to look at. It, it's great, keep a look out for it, follow them on Twitter and you'll find out when the next one in. They do have a continuous call for papers. So if you have an idea and you think it might be a really good talk, whack it on there and they'll talk to you about it, which is really good. Um, there is the day after a BCS Northern Lights conference in Leeds, uh, which I thought I should mention to people because I stumbled across it and they're advertising to say the BCS is absolutely terrible. They should keep going on about all the stuff they do in London because I looked into it and then everybody asked me questions and I think that's similar to what happened to James. Um, it's something we should be thinking about before you've started, before you're even designing, universal design and things like that are great and, and they make it accessible for everybody. And like I say, if we're treating everybody equal and everybody's got something to share, we should think that everybody should need to see what we're doing. Um, a new thing for, for, for tonight is the uh, Ministry of Testing Ask Me Anything new thing which is um, on automation tonight. It's a webinar. We have our own sign-in, so we can have, ask, have some group discussion and ask some awesome questions and then put Richard on the hotspot. Um, I know he has some pre-questions that he's already thought about, but he's going to be taking questions through. So you can think of a really, really gritty <coughs> automation question. It's going to put someone on the hotspot. Ask it. Um, so, now I've warmed the audience up, it's over to our speakers. Um, Martin's first, and since uh, soon as though I didn't realise my wife's laptop didn't have uh, a VGA cable and it only works on VGA, we don't even have to swap PCs. So, thank you very much and welcome Martin. So, really privileged to, um, to be able to speak to you all tonight. Um, I'm just going to give a very short kind of overview of what's going on in the Leeds testing market with a specific focus um, on the rise of automation. Um, so like I said, we're Frish IT. We are a Leeds-based tech recruitment company, and I'm gonna leave the sales there. If you want any more information, then my colleagues Rob and Jay over there um, will be waiting outside. The door's locked. You get out with your CV. <laughs> so Leeds Tech News. Um, as everyone in this room, I'm sure, is aware, um, Leeds is absolutely booming in technology. Um, we've had Companies move to the area to establish their tech teams here. We've had tech consultancies spring up. Um, we've got all sorts of poster childs in terms of technology startups as well. Um, there's, there's record growth. We're outstripping London and Manchester at the moment, which is great for Leeds. Um, it's, it's really a great, great place to be in at the moment. It's a good time to be here as well. Companies are using tech to gain competitive advantage. That's no surprise to anybody. Um, that means to automate in terms of, of business, um, but also increase efficiency. And companies are also using tech to attract the best people. Um, consultancies and end users are competing for, for your talent. Um, there's a huge war for talent. Um, you might, may or may not realise that tech skills are in absolute massive demand and really short supply, which ha is having a really positive effect on the market um, and is driving salaries up. So our salary checker is a good tool. Go use it. Um, if you're a manager, then sorry. Um, but you know, it's, it's accurate information. So what, what's going on in testing? So this is from our point of view. So the things that we're seeing in the market, and, and we have a, a, good, a good overview, I suppose, in terms of dealing with lots of different types of candidates and, and companies as well. Um, we're seeing a massive demand for test automation. Um, we're seeing that testing now needs to be automated and repeatable. Thanks, Gav. I think that's a quote from you. Um, and purely manual testing vacancies are in decline. Um, we're seeing the rise of the developer in test role. Um, with lots of different um, permutations of that job title. Um, but absolutely more and more, test engineers with development skills um, are becoming more and more in demand, um, and people that are stuck with um, are just doing manual um, are starting to see a decline in the amount of jobs that they can apply for. 
Um, specifically in terms of the most in demand um, is automation testers that can build frameworks from scratch. Um, and, and the contract market in particular is strong for any testing professional with coding skills. This next graph is quite interesting. Um, so this is the number of jobs advertised in Yorkshire. Um, I have to admit it's slightly crude, but what I've done is I've pulled off two different job titles. I've looked at jobs from Q1 2015 that were advertised that were look, people looking for test analysts. And I've looked, I've looked also at people who've been looking for automation testers. Um, so orange line on the top, I think it's orange. Yellow, maybe. Um, yeah, I don't really need to explain that one. Um, it's, it's falling. Um, but actually, there's, there's a huge increase in the demand for people that have automation skills. Um, I admit there's other job titles. So this is a slightly crude metric. Um, but the, the overall message is absolutely what we're seeing as well. I mentioned salaries. Um, so salaries are being impacted in a really positive way for people that are in the automation space. Um, I've taken 75th percentile salaries because that's a good, good way of looking at um, kind of what the, the people who are really competing for, um, for the talent will use. Um, and again, bit, bit of a dip, um, but again, looking bottom left to top right, um, you can see that those top paying roles have really, have really started to increase. This is the skills risers and fallers. Um, skills is loose, um, so what this does is it searches for keywords that are placed within any job spec or job advert that, that are anywhere online. Um, rising and falling doesn't necessarily mean like, not popular or, or, or kind of very popular. It just means that the occurrence of these skills is either going up or going down. It doesn't necessarily mean that just because something is going up, the volume of it is less than something that's going down. If you see what I mean, they could be, they could be kind of meeting the middle. Um, so it's, yeah, it's I interesting to see um, some of the kind of more automated um, and I suppose the, the kind of DevOps style um, skills or keywords on the left left side. And the right, I think there's probably some things in here that's like anomalies. Ooh, buzzing if I stand over there. So let's stand over here instead. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I suppose I think you know falling into and ISEP. I think that's probably just around it being renamed. Um, but um, kind of yeah, some of the other things around manual testing. Um, and Microsoft Technologies as well. So we, we've done similar stats around the development space. And it's really interesting to see that the Microsoft Technology stack, whilst it is, is still more popular, um, is falling in terms of demand than anything that's open source. Um, so when you look at the kind of you know, demand for JavaScript type um, roles going, going through the roof, um, .NET roles plateauing or, or kind of declining as well. Um, we're often asked by people how, how you would kind of make a transition from a kind of manual testing role into automation. I'm really, really pleased to see that there's a Q&A session at the end of this, because that means that I'm not going to do any Q&A, and I'm going to let you save all your questions for someone that knows exactly what they're talking about. Um, but here, here's some tips um, in terms of, of staying ahead. So advice that we gathered for anyone looking to venture into automation, um, and you know, this is a mix of our advice, but also advice that when we've asked all of our clients um, who hire people with, with automated test skills, um, and you know, maybe reject people based on the fact that they don't have enough of that on their CV. And we kind of go back and say, well, you know, what can people actually do? Like, what, what if someone really likes your company but wants, wants to go away and do something about it and then come back in six months, 12 months, two years' time? Um, so, so these are the, the kind of top tips that we've gathered from, from our clients. Um, so top one, learn a programming language. Um, if possible, more than one, and both, both static and dynamic. Um, we find that knowledge of continuous integration is highly desirable. Um, be aware of software architecture. Um, also, it takes more than good programming skills. So, you know, emphasize skills around critical thinking, problem solving, and management of delivery of an overall project as well. Um, buddy up with your development team. Um, so, you know, get to understand um, what they're doing and, and maybe you know, get them to coach you. Um, use training resources available through your employer. Lots and lots of employers that we work with um, give either you know, time off to do personal training and development. They also give access to all sorts of online training resources. So you know, use that, um, you know, not just for, for your specific area, but if you've got access to a whole heap of stuff and you're interested in pursuing a career, just you know, maximize that resource. Um, get online. There's, there's so much in terms of um, people who are willing to write blogs, people who are you know, just willing to exchange tweets with you about what you could do to try and get to the position that they're in. Um, and come to events like this. You know, there's a room full of people who are specialized in testing. Um, and developers, sorry, if there's any developers as well, or anyone else, inclusive, diverse. Um, 
yeah, come to events like this and, and kind of you know, learn about what kind of things that you, know, you could be doing. Um, that's it. I said it was short, so we shall leave it there. Um, had refresh my tea. <laughs> well, we'll finish on some sort of slow mo action shot. I like it. I don't know what. What? what I don't know. What, what was I doing just then? <laughs> and what's it going to be superimposed into? Um, great. Thanks very much. So I'm Beth, I'm a senior analyst at 1010, and I'll be surprised if after that mess uh, I don't get fired. Um, <laughs> but um, just really exciting talk for today, because normally when I've like, been to events like these, they're always like super techy and um, sad little anecdote to kind of start this off of why I've thought of alternative meeting ideas is because about a month ago, I was in a meeting where a guy fell asleep. And then last week, I was that person. <laughs> so uh, really helps with um, following my own rules. Um, so just going to give kind of introductions to agile methodologies because not every company is agile, but you can still take some meeting approaches from that just to make your life a bit easier. Um, smaller ideas like little baby steps, nothing major, some deft little things that might help cheer you up your meetings. And then some bigger steps that you can probably try and implement over a longer period. Nothing too major that's world changing, just maybe make your life a bit easier, make your team have a bit more fun and just not as miserable on like a Friday morning when you don't really want to be at work. Um, so gonna play a minor little game. So I'm fully expecting interaction. Uh, so if you don't raise your hands, I will stare at you. Um, <laughs> of meeting bingo, which if a meeting is going pretty rubbish, I like to play this in my head of um, how many times on a conference call you've heard, can you hear me for the first five minutes? I'm totally expecting hands up, by the way. So just like, if you sit there for the whole thing like this, I really won't be surprised. That's a lot more people than I really <laughs> wanted for that one. Uh, pick another really annoying one just to pick on the devs in the room. So I said bonus points if you hear what did you type in to break it in the middle of a defect meeting, or have you said this as a dev? Oh, good little hand at the front. Thanks. <laughs> um, and then the best one after this one, uh, polite, awkward laughter when somebody says something really rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so moving on from the awkward, um, general meetings where your manager makes you have one and you just sit there for the sake of it because you don't actually want to go back to work. Dilbert cartoon. <laughs> yeah. Still raising hands. I've been there. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So agile methodologies. Just simple general rules that kind of flow over from all meetings. If you're agile, sorry, this is going to be a bit boring. Uh, meeting agenda. I mean, everyone should have a meeting agenda. If you're going into a meeting not knowing what you're there for, why are you there? <laughs> um, take anything unnecessary offline. So if you're sat there arguing about a change request or something, maybe discuss it offline and bring it back at a later date. Because if you don't know what you're doing with it, you're going to waste 20 minutes of the meeting arguing with someone for no reason because you don't know what your business wants. And then follow the same basic structure. So daily stand-ups, same 15 minutes, quite simple. Um, if you're going to have the same defect triage, kind of follow the same flow. If you want to keep it boring, keep it boring, but preferably not because I'll fall asleep. <laughs> um, so general rules, meetings start on time because um, I found the last few weeks that um, nobody turns up to my meetings when I organize them. They're normally five minutes late and go close enough. A little bit embarrassing. <laughs> um, if you're overrunning, question how efficient, so preferably finish on time as well. And everyone is responsible for the meeting. So if you don't have something to add, probably don't go because you're just going to waste people's time um, unless it's actually important that you be there. So uh, devs, yeah, please come because we need you. Yeah, see, yeah, thanks, Luke. Uh, <laughs> um, identify action points. So if you've got something that you're discussing in the meeting and you're not taking anything away from it to actually do after the meeting, question why you're in the meeting. Because if you're not actually working from it, why are you wasting half an hour sat talking? And not just because you don't want to do the work. Questionable. Uh, two golden rules that I found that MPS, which is the client I'm on right now, um, like to follow is why am I talking? If you're talking for no reason, shut up. Um, and enough, let's move on. So if you're going to go on and on and on about something, stop talking. <laughs> Same thing. I should probably go. Sorry. 
Um, <laughs> general guide. Each team member should attend the meeting prepared. So if you've got a morning stand-up or a general meeting where it's a defect meeting, know what you want to talk about. So if you're going to complain to your dev, sorry, recruiters, um, maybe go in there, because they don't have to complain. It's nice. <laughs> don't boo me. <laughs> <laughs> So if you're gonna if you're gonna go to a meeting and have issues, then um, know what they are, because <laughs> your dev's gonna not appreciate it if you go. I think this is my problem and not remember it. And if you're not being transparent, saying what you want out of it and that kind of thing, then question what you're doing wrong, not why you should be there because you probably should at this point, but what are you not adding to your meeting that makes it valuable? So if you're not talking, you're not doing what you're supposed to do, then are you doing your job? because you're going to have to attend meetings at some point. Are you leading or facilitating? So managers, project managers, test leads. If you're a leader, you're going to be a bit more emotional. If there's arguments be between your devs and your testers, are you going to get on the side of your testers and get down devs' throats? Or are you going to facilitate it and question them? Are you going to get the topic to move on? Or are you going to argue? And are you going to come to a conclusion? Because if you sit there for arguing 20 minutes, when you can get over the topic in five, because you've asked them what they want, it's going to make it easier for everyone. <laughs> so baby steps. So uh, the person who I wanted to credit, this top one too, is not here. Uh, so Thomas Crabtree, if any of you know Thomas Crabtree. Yeah. Daily discipline. If you're late to the meeting, you have to tell a joke. <laughs> and we've had some pretty terrible ones from Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, don't rehash old news, so if you discuss something in the last meeting and you still don't get it, go to that person separately and ask about it because they'd rather spend 20 minutes properly explaining it to you with a demonstration than going over it in front of 10 people when the other nine don't care. Um, and location, location, location. Really cheesy, shouldn't reference a TV show. Is it summer, is it Friday, and are you having an early meeting? I'm going to go with uh, don't go to the pub. I mean, 4 o'clock on a Friday, might get away with it, but uh, 11 o'clock on a Monday morning, nah. You could go for coffee instead. <laughs> you could go for coffee instead. If it's lunchtime and you have to work through lunch, then you could grab a coffee and not be in the office and feel as miserable. So, what do you mean there's a meeting on Friday? No one likes the Friday meetings. So, quickly going through this, the yay or nay of meetings. Monday morning meetings, you've been off for the weekend. You're not going to remember what you did on Friday. Maybe save it till Monday afternoon when you've remembered what you're doing and maybe woken up a little bit from the beer haze, although it's Thursday, I shouldn't have said that. Uh, Friday afternoon meetings, you want to go home. It's the weekend. Meetings that start on the hour, really boring study reference here. Um, meetings that start on the hour are found not to be as effective because they don't start on time because you turn up five minutes late saying close enough. People forget what time it is because it's not memorable as quarter past, half past. So start it a bit later. That might actually get people to remember to turn up. And that's actually worked quite well so far at where I'm at. Um, people quite like that. And it's a bit useful. <laughs> working lunches. Uh, everyone hate working lunches where you have to sit there in a meeting and they don't give you any free pizza, which I'm sure you all want now. Pizza? Yeah? You don't want to work through lunch. Uh, so the next question on that is, do you actually provide food, whether it's bring your own lunch? Yes, guy in the middle, I like you. Uh, <laughs> preferably provide food, um, but when? Do you start it out when everyone's not talking, or do you say, we're going to have sandwiches at the end, and you can enjoy your lunch afterwards, and you'll finish the meeting faster? Uh, found that works if you actually just sit there with the sandwiches on the side and you just bribe everyone to actually get through the meeting. Really great. Um, and the question again, do you need to be here? All the time, probably yes. But if you're not going to add anything, then if you've only got one point, say it's a defect meeting, then you can probably pass that note on to your fellow tester and they'll do it for you and it'll still get to the dev on time. And you'll probably get through the meeting faster because you're not sat there hating life. Uh, actually useful ideas this time instead of me droning on. <laughs> so annoying meeting behaviour and we've probably all been one of these at some point. The person who talks too much, you're just saying a bit of crap and you're not actually helping anyone. So again, why am I talking? Um, the person who agrees with everything, 
So they like everyone's idea, but that means you're never going to get a conclusion. So think about what you do like and actually have an opinion because you don't want to be that person that's going, I like this, I like this, and you don't help anyone get anywhere. <laughs> or the complete opposite, you hate everything. Nothing is a good idea and it's never going to work. So stop talking. <laughs> if you've got a really valuable input and you really agree with that valuable input, go for it. But just don't hate life because nothing's going to get done. The saboteur, nothing is taken seriously. Here's to looking at you, James. Um, <laughs> the person who sits on their phone in the middle of the meeting, they don't listen to what's going on, and they generally don't help your meeting move along because you're constantly <laughs> having to stop the meeting to say, what do you think about this? Yeah. There's always someone sat on the phone. Yeah. Massive meetings. Um, and the person who isn't there, well, physically, they are but they're probably asleep or they're sat in the corner not caring and they're not paying attention to the business <laughs> updates. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on from that, sorry, Jim. <laughs> um, if your meetings aren't working and they're generally, you're getting nowhere with them, they're spending an hour when you could actually be spending 20 minutes, talk to your team about what they want. If you're bored and things aren't working, then talk about what works for you meeting times that are better. If you've got someone that doesn't want to get up and come to a half eight meeting, maybe have it at 10 a.m. and then it'll fit in with the rest of the team. Because it's, it's not going to be the same for everybody. You've just got to find that compromise that will work. And then come up with a general setup that works for you. So if somebody really hates four o'clock meetings and they don't turn up to them because they want to go home because they get up early, have it a bit earlier. And then compromise on everything and you'll probably find a meeting flow that works for you all. Ma minimize time. Everyone gets to say what they're doing. Everyone gets to say what they've done the last few days or last day um, and gets a point across on what's going to be working on with the whole team and keep things moving and show that you value each other's time because nothing's worse than somebody making you feel disrespected and they don't listen to what you have to say in a meeting. Um, and can you summarise your point in less than a minute? And I probably should have read my slides because I'm staring at them a lot. <laughs> um, Less than a minute, elevator talk. If you can't say to someone what your job is, what you're doing that day in less than a minute, how hard is your job? Do you need help with it? Should you take it offline and discuss any extras that you need? And you'll probably have that support there because you're in a team. If your teammates aren't working with you, then you really need to communicate more. And follow up action. So if you've got a decision made in your meeting, who's going to do it? If you don't write down and allocate tasks, will it ever actually get done? You could be sat there six weeks later complaining about the same thing. And if it doesn't get done, then you're just going to keep complaining and the cycle continues. Uh, longer meetings. So I found that if you've got like a two hour meeting, Agile, anyone? Um, normally everyone I've worked with has started with a little game. Hence why I put that bingo on. Um, it's normally to wake everyone up. Uh, it's really hot here. Uh, <laughs> so, I can't remember, like we've played games where you juggle imaginary balls with your teammates, that kind of thing, it just wakes everyone up, because if you're going to be sat there for a two hour meeting discussing work, you're, you're going to be half asleep by halfway through, so take breaks, take little mini games, play with everyone. Um, Visualisation, so if everyone wants to write on post-it notes, if you want to put stuff up on the walls, that normally helps, because I've quite found that a lot of IT guys sorry to generalise, <laughs> um, are more visual than they are anything else. So if you've got like diagrams, images, you put everything up around them, you're more likely to remember what you're actually talking about and get through your points. Same with whiteboards, if you're playing around with stuff and moving things and just spreading stuff out on the table, you'll be able to see what you're talking about and get your job done. And be positive, because if, no one, if everyone's sat there miserable, you're probably going to fall asleep. <laughs> so yeah, uh, be positive, meeting leader, if you're in charge, just maybe don't be miserable because you're going to make everyone feel a bit sad. And questions, <laughs> now that I've rambled on for a while. <laughs> so anyone got any questions or can I run up? Yes. Did I fell asleep? Did he snore? No, he more woke himself up and was really startled and embarrassed, <laughs> which is kind of where the inspiration came from. <laughs> So it wasn't too bad. Yes, Luke. What's your opinion on laptops in meetings? We have a thing where we just, the only person who's allowed the laptop is the person who's presenting or the people who are potentially presenting. So I 
think it depends where you're working. Some places are completely banned laptop unless you're going to screen share, and that'll be the one person that does the screen share. Or where I'm at right now, everyone takes their laptop so they can have their notes of what they want to talk about rather than handwriting everything. So then you've got like post-its and you've got reminders on what your points are going to be and what you're going to talk about. So it just depends on what works for your team. But Not if you make the meeting interesting. <laughs> if you make the meeting interesting, then no. <laughs> so if, if you've got everything engaged and it's moving along at a comfortable pace, generally I haven't found people messing around on their laptops, unless you're going to go on Facebook. Um, but normally it's not as bad, but generally people will do that if they're not engaged, and that's kind of the point of avoiding this. So, yep. Yes? People physically moving is a better, better than doing sat down talking games to try and get an office. I personally prefer standing up and moving around, but some people don't like standing up and moving. So I do like that whole agile thing of having morning stand ups because then people are moving and they're a bit more engaged because they're not going to be sat there just like, right, I'm fed up with this now. So for me, yes, but it doesn't work for everyone. But I do, I do prefer having a stood up meeting because people will say what they think a bit faster and get through it because they don't want to be stood up for the half an hour or an hour. If you do it in 20 minutes, you're going to get through your points faster. But, yeah? Um, do you think meetings only when you need a meeting? If you're having a meeting for the sake of having a meeting, no, <laughs> please no. <laughs> Um, but if you're making a big decision, if you're discussing defects, if there's business changes, if they're actually vital into making a decision, then you should always have a meeting as far as I'm concerned as a tester. But it just it depends on what you need. But I would say meeting for the sake of it, no, I don't like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hence the first slide of having an agenda. <laughs> yep. Do you have a recommended length meeting? Uh, if you've got bigger decisions to make, normally an hour. If you're just doing like defect triages and a catch up, 20 minutes is usually enough. Unless you've got, say, it's been a whole week, um, then you're probably going to have longer meetings. It depends on the frequency of them. So you have like, meetings every day, 15 minutes generally varies depending on what the agenda is and the topic but I'd say probably no shorter than 15 minutes and no longer than two hours because someone's going to go out with their mind by that point. I find to apply anything over an hour you need a break and yeah. really hyperactive so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm exactly the same. <laughs> Uh, a defect triage is where the testers and the developers meet together and discuss any bugs that they've found and possible solutions and what the developers are going to do to affect, like have an effect on that, when it's going to be brought in and changed, and general solutions on where the problem is and how it works to discuss it. So it's kind of a collaborative meeting on bugs. That's why are you just there? Uh, because at the moment, my devs are in Tel Aviv and I can't pair with them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just casually fly out every couple of days. <laughs> yep. Yeah. This one's probably for anyone, but what's the best way to sort of like Elmo if you make someone go on their journal? Uh, in all honesty, be blunt, but I'm, I'm as subtle as a brick to the face, so that's probably not going to help from my approach. Um, if they go in on a bit, then kind of maybe curtail them, ask them if they can get to the point, that kind of thing, but I'm... I'm I'm of the approach of I'm a bit of a dick in a meeting because I I don't like sitting there so move it on kind of just like talk to them and just be like yeah what's your point what are you getting to um, but that's me might not work for everyone if you're not confrontational but I'm not going to apologise for that so don't start laughing. <laughs> well we had one guy who had a tennis ball and you were only allowed to talk when you had the tennis ball in that meeting. It didn't work very well because everyone started shouting over each other, so I wouldn't recommend like a prop for people not to talk. <laughs> it went really badly. <laughs> but yeah, uh, and <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Um, so I am the talk before your pizza break, and I get to have the fun of introducing it. So if everyone wants to like kind of turn around and run to the back away from me because I'm sweating, <laughs> go get me. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, I'm James, I work for Invica, which is a digital agency. We mostly build websites, content sites, e-commerce, and just kind of custom web apps. Um, and, and today I'm talking about accessibility, um, so kind of a brief overview of what is an accessible website. Why bother? What are the types of disability that affect how you use the web? Um, some key concepts that sort of the terminology and the kind of the types of accessibility, um, and then I'll introduce some tools, and hopefully there'll be some time for questions at the end as well. So, brief glossary. Um, you probably know the middle two, but WCAG is Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, and that's a W3C, um, very long, long doc complicated document, um, but it sort of it's, it sets out what they think is an accessible website. Um, and then ARIA, um, is accessible rich internet applications and that's sort of a, a framework for building accessibility into kind of complex applications that would otherwise be inaccessible. So things like interactive, w interactive web apps, um, things with very heavy front ends, you might use this technology for that. So would anyone like to um, suggest a definition of accessibility or, or what is an accessible website? Anyone? <laughs> James Bell will want to use an accessibility yes, test. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> website which is accessible to anyone regardless of any disability or condition. Yeah, great. So yeah, so I've got so I've got can be used by people with disabilities and also and therefore can be used by everyone. Um, an accessible site might sh should play nicely with accessibility software hardware. Um, it could meet it could meet the WCAG 2.0 double A spec, but it might not. It might be that actually the spec's wrong. You know, it's, it's, up to, it's, it's about whether the users can use it rather than whether you match the spec. And an accessible site could also be, could be well structured, could be coded, coded in a semantic way, um, and hopefully also it's easy to use as well. Um, so, you know, the, the, you could have an accessible site that's difficult to use, but generally these things tend to go together. So why bother? First of all, it is the law that you have to provide reasonable adjustments to, to people with disabilities, um, and there, there is guidance available on what what's kind of what, what counts as reasonable. Um, examples of situations where you should make adjustments. In terms of in terms of legal cases in the UK, there's been a few cases settled, um, but no one's gone to court over it. In the US, it's a bit different. People have actually been been taken to court and they've lost because they should have made an adjustment and they refused to do it. Um, it's also a business opportunity. If everyone can use your site compared to your competitors, then you can increase your market share. Um, you could even make it a, a unique selling point. So Apple are great at accessibility. And I think for a lot of people, it's they what if they have a disability, then Apple is probably where they'll look first. Um, at the very minimum, it could improve the usability and sort of the conversion rates in terms of e-commerce. Um, now, so this is a video Apple made. Um, I, only, I, saw, I saw it the other day and I thought it was a great, great example of what accessibility is about. People think that having a disability is a barrier. But that's not the way I see it. You can catch up with friends. Ready? You can capture a moment with your family. One face. Small face. Focus lock. And you can start the day bright and early. You can take a trip to somewhere new. Three miles to the summit. You 
you can concentrate on every word of the story. A bird began to sing. Jack opened his eyes. You can take the long way home. a film like this one. When technology is designed for everyone, it lets anyone do what they love, including me. So, I think that what the video shows is that you've got you've got special adaptations built in to Apple software, but also they're showing how their software can be used to make people with disabilities be able to do something. Um, so it's a good mix of, of things showing off and obviously showing the showing the reasons behind why they do it as well. So and then so another good reason for accessibility is that it does it does benefit everyone. Some disabilities they're minor, so if you've got if you're far sighted or you've got to a strain injury, then you might benefit from increasing your text size on the page or not having to use the mouse too much. Some disabilities are temporary, so if you break your glasses, break your arm, then you might, you might use some of the adaptations that someone who has a, a permanent disability w would use for that period of time. And then as I've said, accessible types, they tend to be easier to use, so if you're, if you're making it easier to use for people with disabilities, then hopefully everyone, everyone can benefit from that as well. Accessibility order also correlates quite a lot with SEO usability. So things like good HTML structure, descriptive alt text and link text, um, and having clear navigation in terms of on the page, from page to page. These are all important if you're using accessibility software, um, but it's also good to have generally. So there's sort of a, a Venn diagram of of that, so if you've got SEO and usability, hopefully your content is, is high quality, both for, for humans and for search engines. If you've got SEO and accessibility, then you've got structured content that both search engines and screen readers can understand. If you've got usability and accessibility, then you've got accessible content in terms of content that people can find, they can navigate to it. And if you've got, if you've got all three, then you've got structured, accessible, high quality content. Um, so, there's a few types of disability that are particularly relevant to the web um, and just sort of software in general. So, physical and motor impairments. Um, if you have any sort of motion restriction or poor motor skills, so for example like a tremor, then you might be unable to use a mouse or a keyboard or even both of those things. So, you could use, um, you could use an assistive switch. So, this is like a joystick which you'd use to sort of move between elements on the page and then you can program these buttons how you like. Um, you could use eye tracking software instead of a mouse. Um, and also if you have any, of any, of any, any sort of physical impairment then you might find it difficult to click on a small link or a button on the page. So it's sort of, it's about having, making sure that, um, that you're, not having, you're not making links or buttons too small or too fiddly. Um, if you have a visual impairment, this obviously includes blindness but you could be partially sighted as I said or you could be colour blind. I expect most of you have seen these diagrams before. Can everyone, can everyone see the number in, in, the, in that? Can anyone, can anyone not see it? Yeah. And it's 74, yeah. <laughs> did, anyone th did, did, did anyone think they could see it but Six. saw a different number? <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> So yeah, so what this diagram shows obviously is is the need for good colour contrast. You've got to have a good contrast between the foreground and the background. And that also that also extends to things like um, link colouring. If your link doesn't have an underline or, it's, or isn't a different colour, then how do you know it's a link? Um, especially if you if you've got poor vision. Um, so someone with visual impairment will, will probably want to adjust their font size, or perhaps they they can't see at all, so they use a screen reader. Um, cognitive impairment, so that includes things like dementia, but really anything that affects your memory, your, your ability to reason, your attention span, any of these things, you might need more instructions 
some extra help text on the page. Um, a lot of, a lot of e-commerce sites have a time limit on purchasing. And if that, if that time limit isn't reasonable, then they can't make a purchase. So that's obviously a, a loss for the customer, a loss for the business. And it's a case of, do you, do you need the time limit? Can you find, can you maybe make it a bit longer? Um, or can you, you know, can you make the, can you make the, the application easier to use so you can do it within the time? Um, things like shorter sentences, simpler, t simpler, simpler language can also help as well. Dyslexia, um, it's, it's a learning difficulty, um, but it, it, most people think of it in terms of reading and writing, but it's, you can also, people with dyslexia can also quite find it hard to, 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 to read all of these things, so large blocks of text, narrow columns, <coughs> wide columns, justify text because they're uneven spacing. Some, some people with dyslexia don't like pure white background, so they prefer an off-white background. Um, serif fonts, italic text, small text, moving text, any of these things could make it harder for someone with dyslexia um, to read a website. Um, there's also things like epilepsy, so obviously flashing images, that sort of thing. Um, and any other learning difficulties such as dyspraxia or dyscalculia, these, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to adapt for these things, but it's perhaps one to be aware of. So Caulfields is a consultancy and they've written this, this guide, so um, I'll link to these slides after, after the talk so you can go and have a look at that. So in, in terms of key concepts and accessibility, the first one is keyboard accessibility, so that means being able to navigate the site with just your keyboard. Um, so generally that's the tab bar, the tab key, space bar, return key and, and the arrow keys particularly important for form fields, page navigation, and any sort of custom interface. So if you're using drag and drop, it's quite hard to do that with a keyboard. So think about, can you implement an alternative to drag and drop that works with the keyboard? And generally speaking, if you've got good keyboard accessibility, then any alternative input device could also work with that, those same adjustments. So screen readers, um, these, this is two examples. This is the Windows one called JAWS and ChromeVox is a Chrome extension. Um, if you're using a screen reader, you should expect to be able to access all the information that a sighted person could see in the same order. Um, you, you, need, you need labels on form elements. You need your, your link text to be descript descriptive. So click here is not that helpful if it's just a link without context. Um, you want to avoid unnecessary repetition, not a, not a massive deal, but if you hear the same, the same content read out over and over again, it's, it's quite annoying. Um, and then the key thing, obviously, is having content that's trapped in images, and a screen reader just can't read that. So uh, WebAIM, which is um, Accessibility Specialist Consultancy, they've written this guide, so again, check it out afterwards. Um, in color accessibility, um, so that includes colour blindness but also any kind of visual impairment. Um, so things like labels and keys on charts and graphs, um, error success indicators on forms, um, any of these things, they shouldn't be purely colour based if possible. So you can use a text label or an icon to, to indicate success and failure. If you're making a chart, then maybe have solid lines and dotted lines as well as the colour, as well as the colour differences. Um, now this, the, the second bullet point is in all different colours, and we don't want to like to guess which of these are colour compliant, have the, have the right contrast ratio. So, so that so the red is the only one that's colour compliant, even if most of the people, if most people in the room can probably read this whole line, but. Red's the only one that sort of passes it in a, in a technical sense. And that's because it's, it's, it's bold and it's above a certain size. If it was smaller or not bold, that, w that would also not pass. Um, so Jerry Cody... Like hmm? like like yeah. So, I mean, if, 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 if the background of this page was, was a different colour, then yellow might be fine. Mm. But, it, it, but yellow and white are the very similar colours, so... Um, but, but, then, but then, as you say, strength of colour. So bold is a, is a way of making the colours feel stronger so you can get away with a lower contrast sometimes. So Jerry Cody, 
is, um, she's a designer, front-ender, and she's written this great guide, and there's also a book um, um, that she's written as well. So, onto the tools. This is a great little tool. You put in any colour in two boxes, and it tells you the ratio. And you can see in this case that it's not that it's it's orange, which means it's okay. And then actually, just by tweaking the colours a bit, I've I've met the the 4.5 ratio. Um, and let's say, what's it like on grey? No, terrible. Light grey, not very good, but maybe just about passable. So you know, so white and that that particular shade is what you want, and that one, not very different. But it, you know, it's in terms of technical compliance. The eventual colour, 4.5. So that's the one you want. Or a different colour entirely, perhaps. So, screen readers, um, these, these three, Chrome, Vox, VoiceOver, NVDA, they're all free. Um, they'll all do the job in terms of accessibility testing. Um, but if you, if you were doing it, if you're doing it properly, then you would probably use multiple ones, but sort of an, one of them is enough to get an idea. Um, they all have different quirks. For example, NVDA is Windows only, and it and it works best with Firefox. You'll kind of get some odd results in other browsers, which means that most of NVDA's users will use Firefox. Um, and there's there's others available, um, but they tend to be quite expensive, especially the Windows ones. Um, and WebAIM have usage guides for all of the screen readers, so you can get a, a gist of how to use them quite quickly. IOS has loads of accessibility functions. So color, um, this one here, it, it is meant to counteract um, forms of color blindness. So if you have deuteranopia, then you apply that green red, green red filter and it will try and counteract that. But you can use that as a sort of a test. If you put, if you put one of these filters on, can you still t tell colors apart? Um, VoiceOver is, is the iOS screen reader. Um, it's quite hard to it's quite hard to use at first, but they give instructions. There's a practice, there's a lot of practice ground you can play around with as well. And then if you turn on these settings in speech, you can speak to selected text. If you select the text and click speak, and then speak the screen, you swipe down with two fingers, and it's just like a quick check of of how, of how does this page sound? Is it is it like what you're seeing on the screen? Um, now these are my favourite bit of the talk. Um, I've, I've, uh, I've, I've used the fruition site as the guinea pig this, this evening. <laughs> so, <laughs> not a good start. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> okay. So, so. It says it says twenty it says twenty seven errors, but actually, I, I, and I went through this last night, and it's, it's actually it actually does all right in terms of accessibility. Um, so the first the first thing on the page is you've got there's there's alt text for the logo. That's great. You can you can know what the company is um, if you're using a screen reader. Um, you're using you've got a section element here, so you know it's the header. Um, and then there's you've got you know you've got you've got good heading, so that's the main heading on the page. Um, the one thing, I, one thing I, I would say there is that there's, it's a carousel, but there's no control, so you can't stop it. Um, you, can't, you, you can't switch back and forth, so if you're using a screen reader, it's fine, you just hear all three of them at once, probably. But if you're just using a screen reader at all, you might find it confusing that it keeps switching between things. Um, this one here says there's two labels for the same form element, which should be, um, which could, could make it difficult to select that particular particular field. Um, and again, we've got um, we've got semantic headings. We've got 
an empty, empty alt text, which is good because this is a decorative image. Um, in other words, you don't need to know what the image is. It's just, it's just decorative. And by leaving it empty, that tells the, that tells the screen reader that it's fine. It's just, just ignore that. Um, now this one here, it says there's, there's a linked image, but there's no alternative text. So it might be hard to know where the link goes. However, you've got a heading here. You've got a link here. So you'd be able to find where you want it to go. But maybe if the, if the image had some descriptive text on it, that would be helpful. Um, all of the client logos have alt text on that matches the, matches the name. So that's great. It doesn't like this because it says read more. So what it's saying here is that it'd be better to have something like view our clients. Obviously there's, there's things to improve but they've made the effort and it wouldn't be too hard for someone with a screen reader to, to, to navigate this site so that's, that's great. Um, Chrome has an accessibility extension. It lets you do audits of the whole page and also kind of drill down into elements and see what the accessibility features of that element are. Um, it's useful for debugging or sort of drilling down. So if you've seen this, if you've seen this talk and you think I'd like to, I'd like to learn some some more, um, or maps try, try it out, then one th some things you could do, you could just download a screen reader, try and try and listen to the page, um, and then also. Try unplugging your mouse and see if you can use your site. You can get around, fill in the forms, that sort of thing. Um, you can use the tool I just used on your own site. Um, it's always, it's always an interesting one. Um, and then, if you spend a bit of time on this and you think, I think we should be investing in this, then you can use these findings to justify, you know, your company or your team's dedication resources to this. And I think my opinion is that that as a tester it's not just about finding bugs, it's about advocating for, for good practice, better usability and accessibility is just one part of that. So I um, hope you enjoyed that and any questions? Yeah? Sorry, not really questions but just two other tips. Yeah. We used to test the NHS website. Mm. Um, one is don't just use Chrome. Developers do that a lot. Yeah, yeah. It's got so many plugins. People just test Chrome, yeah. and someone else will open it in Edge or Firefox, and it will fall over. Exactly, so yeah. Don't fall for that. And same likewise, if you're an Apple house, don't just use Safari. Um, the second one I want to say about is there's some interesting stuff where this is going called the next billion users. Mm. So a lot of what accessibility about has been about in the past is keyboards. Which yeah. Brilliant, my one, by the way. Um, <laughs> but the next billion users is all on voice. Yeah. So. I mean, people may have Amazon Alexa around here at the house, or Siri, or, or the new Chrome bit. But Facebooks, the, the Googles of this world are all about the people in Africa, the people in uh, Southeast Asia, etc., who won't ever use a keyboard. Yep. They may not speak English very well. So the accessibility for them, and the people more nearer to us, is how well can you navigate a site, or a tool can navigate a site, purely on voice. Yep. So something to think about for the next sort of two or three years. Yeah, absolutely. yeah. I mean, um, one, one of my um, sales colleagues was having a similar conversation with me recently, and what, and, what, and what he was saying was that perhaps we need to forget about the website entirely because they may not, we may, may just need to make the content available on Alexa, Google, whatever, so that you can access this content even if you never use go and go to the site. So it's obviously that has a business benefit, but it means that if you if you're just speaking to a speaker getting some information, then obviously be, being on those platforms is, is great for those people and great for you. So, yeah. Yeah? Uh, where do you find the happy balance in um, looking at a website? So you said the WCAG web, uh, guidelines, mm. so I know it's like A, double A, triple A. Yeah. So where do you sort of go, right, this is enough sort of thing, or do you sort of always try and aim for the AAA, or is it a... So most, most people who are making, trying to of get compliance will aim for double A compliance. A is basic and triple A is really strict and it's, it's all, it is very hard to achieve. You know, you, you probably would need to make drastic changes to your site to achieve that. 
Um, so double A is is a good one to aim for, but as I said, it's not it's not the, the only thing to aim for. It's actually put it in front of different users and and see if they can use it as well. Hello. So, knowing Apple, they will have they will have thought of thought of a way of of making it so that actually you you tap on one thing um, to select it, and then you tap your target to move it to that right place. I would have think that's how they've how they've done it. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 So if you so if if, if you if you, th there will be a setting somewhere to turn that on, I would think. Um, but things like, but, I mean, but VoiceOver has lot. It's, it's a very different way of using your phone. If you turn VoiceOver on, it's very difficult actually because you've got to tap things twice and three times to get them to do the right thing. So I would assume they've they've done something there. Yeah. Any other questions? Did you say you're going to link to your yes. Um, so my website there. If you scroll down enough, you will eventually find it um, and I'll try and link to it on Twitter um, this evening or tomorrow as well. So I've made a blog post of basically the content of this talk and there's also the slides as well. Great. Um, thank you. <laughs>